Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm the third speaker today, so I, uh, I wanted to, to share with you some of uh, our work that's a little bit more translational, that's much more, uh, I guess, closer to uh, clinical applications, uh, give some examples. Uh, in, in this case, some of our technology that we, we have translated into uh, a startup company, and, uh, and also tell you a little bit about you know, the history of that. Um, on Friday, fr or Thursday morning, there's an entrepreneurial session, and you'll hear a lot of different speakers from, from different aspects of that. And, and, and hopefully you get a sense it's a theme that we think is important uh, for you to know about and as being an option for where you could take some of the technologies that you're working on and, and really have a separate career path for, for translating these into uh, uh, startup companies and, and other uh, technologies. So uh, the actual topic I want to focus on is our interoperative OCT work, uh, pr primarily in, in breast cancer. So I, I want to show this again. I think this is the third time I've shown this. But, uh, but I think it's a, an important slide. And particularly because in, in this talk, we're going to be in this realm, uh, really looking at uh, the gold standard histology that's used for interoperative work and uh, where OCT uh, can come in to complement uh, that work as well. So histology is, of course, the gold standard for a lot of tissue diagnostics. And very often, we consider it too little and too late uh, for the diagnostics or the information that we need. Uh, you know, it's essential, and, but in the case of surgery, uh, it, it often comes days later and, uh, and not timely when we need it. Uh, in addition, it's somewhat limited in information because you're only sampling uh, a, si a very small subset of the tissue of interest. And, uh, and as you'll see an example, when we, when we take off tissue from surgery, there's a lots of tissue, but they have to make very specific decisions in terms of what gets analyzed microscopically uh, for the diagnosis. Um, and so just using histology alone, uh, clinicians can't necessarily use microscopic histological information uh, to diagnose or optimize the treatment of the point of care. And, uh, and so in the case of surgery, uh, a lot of surgery cases uh, result in repeated procedures, delayed treatment, uh, and problems. And so the New York Times in 2012 uh, highlighted some of this and, and basically saying that there is poor quality of care in the case of breast uh, cancer surgery. Of the roughly 2,200 women who had lumpectomies uh, in this case, 23% needed reoperations. Uh, that uh, that number is actually quite higher. Other studies have shown uh, 30, 35 percent, even as high as 50 percent uh, of, of women that have had to come back and, and have repeat operations because, again, the surgeon doesn't have that microscopic view when, they're, when he or she is trying to make a decision, did they get all the tumor. Uh, <clears throat> also, the number of operations, it depends on, on where you're treated and, you know, really what the, the number of cases uh, that the surgeon sees. And so there's a very high subjective component here. <clears throat> it's also very costly. So every time, uh, you know, this number is, seems very low, but just to come in to do a re-excision costs thousands of dollars. And if you have to repeat this many, many times over all the surgeries that are performed, those dollars get quite large. So if we look at uh, breast cancer treatment today, uh, typically, uh, there's screening that's performed, x-ray mammography or MR mammography. Uh, if there's an abnormality, there will be a, a biopsy done, uh, a needle biopsy to take out a small bit of tissue to look at microscopically under a microscope. Um, that, that's because pretty much all diagnostic decisions have to be made on actual tissue. And so um, there's very few examples where diagnostics are made just on images alone. We saw one example with our first speaker. When you can't take out tissue, uh, like in the eye, then you have to rely on that image-based features. Uh, but here we do. We take out tissue. So um, the, the patient will go for surgery, pathology analysis to look at that specimen, and particularly the margin, uh, can take about five days. And this results in about 30 percent of re-excisions. What we envision changing this, this workflow is that we would provide interoperative screening and using OCT or other techniques 
uh, to be able to uh, look microscopically, give that microscopic view to the surgeon, and thereby perhaps reduce or even eliminate that type of re-excision. There is uh, 1.5 million breast cancer cases worldwide each year, so this has a potential savings of about a billion dollars if we can make this type of uh, intervention. So if we think about how optics is used in breast cancer, there's quite a few other areas, light microscopy, of course, in the, in the path lab. We saw a lot of that from uh, Professor Bargov's talk. Uh, fluorescence detection, uh, they use diffuse optical tomography. And we'll hear <coughs> about DOT actually tomorrow in the context of the brain imaging. But, uh, but that's used for looking at uh, metabolic or functional changes uh, within the breast. And then uh, spectroscopy we heard about this morning. And then coherence imaging, or OCT, uh, which gives us um, a structural image that looks quite similar to that of histology. So if we think about the, the flow, the patient flow that uh, uh, patients go through and where optical imaging can have an impact, uh, I mentioned patient screening, the needle biopsy, open surgery, the, the pathological exam, either the gross specimen or the microscopic exam. And typically these are what's used today for different modalities, x-ray, MR, uh, ultrasound for guiding needle biopsies, uh, histology, and then again, histology in different ways of an analyzing that tissue. But, uh, but there really are areas all along here where optics can play a role, either in optical mammography, guiding needles, assessing margins or lymph nodes, and even guiding the histological assessment because these specimens that pathology re receives can be quite large. And currently, the standard is for the pathologist to look visually, perhaps feel, palpate areas that look suspicious, and then cut those out, send those for microscopic analysis. In the case of breast tumor um, margins, that method only analyzes about 0.01% of the entire margin of a, a specimen. And so it's very much undersampling uh, the tissue that's there. Well, I want to talk about these four uh, this morning. So essentially what we are trying to do is shift this paradigm from looking microscopically in the path lab to doing this type of microscopic analysis in real time and, uh, and give that, that ability then to look microscopically. So OCT, of course, is uh, the technology that we've been developing to do this uh, now for probably about 14 years since I've been here. Uh, and we talked about this uh, last week. I showed the same slide. But, um, but again, it, it's, it's important to recognize that this is a, a label-free method, uh, which gives us an advantage over other uh, types of uh, interoperative procedures and optical techniques that will use dyes or, or, or stains. And, uh, and we get this information in, in real time. And the fact that it's digital information, you'll see that we can computationally analyze it as well. So uh, standard OCT uh, by either changing that reference arm path length or using spectral domain approaches, we can acquire uh, depth scans. And these are A scans based on the optical uh, refractive index. Uh, and uh, it's the intensity of the backscattered light. That re represents a column, and we can scan across in some way to collect our, our two- or three-dimensional images. Uh, I showed you last week where we can, with high NA microscopy, we can capture um, these on-FOS imaging and, and look at the, uh, the, this volumetric data as well. Well, OCT is very much uh, portable and modular, and so the heart of that is usually built up of fiber optic components. OCT over the, you know, the decades has actually uh, leveraged a lot of the, the technologies that are developed in telecom. And so our optical sources, um, this is a, a laser here, but our small superluminescent diodes or our, our, our optical sources, our detectors, all of our fiber optics and components really all are low cost because of telecom. And we can put these into portable systems for, uh, for clinical use. And we have to get the light to the tissue in some way. So we can interface that with surgical microscopes. We can send catheters uh, into, uh, into lumens. We can put these in needle probes to sample into, the, say, the breast tissue. Or uh, another example I'll show today is a handheld probe that a surgeon could use to image uh, in the operating room. Well, this started 
Uh, some of our first data came out in the early 2000s, and we were seeing things like this, where uh, our OCT image of invasive ductal carcinoma uh, compares quite well to that of, of histology. We don't have the, the, net, the, the selective staining uh, that are used in histology, uh, but we see structure. And uh, the resolution in, in this case is not quite as high as the histology, but you can still make out adipocytes, the fat cells, and, and the other more scattering stroma. Now in lymph nodes, uh, lymph nodes were interesting because uh, lymph nodes look differently depending on their microenvironment. And in a normal lymph node, it's still a very dense packed, packing of cells, normal cells. Uh, but when there's met metastases involved, that disrupts that, that cellular arrangement. And we notice that there is a distinct difference in the optical backscattering on OCT when you have that disrupted uh, cellular arrangement than when you don't. And so that type of, of alterations and scattering is really at that single scatterer level and how those are packed differently. And that's been hel helpful for us to try to assess whether or not a lymph node contains metastatic disease or not. So I want to briefly go through a number of different studies that we've done uh, over the years, both preclinical and clinical. Uh, one includes using OCT for guiding needle biopsies, uh, for interoperative assessment of lymph nodes and tumor margins, and then talk a little bit about our computational approaches and adaptive optics to be able to improve our image quality. And finally, some of our endogenous molecular imaging using our, our CARs or our uh, NIVI, which is the interferometric CARs. So our translational research uh, protocol involves bringing systems into the operating room and being able to analyze tissues like this. This is a lumpectomy specimen that's been removed that would traditionally be sent right off to pathology. Instead, we use it to, in this early set, uh, to be able to place it on a stage to image the margin, or it's hard to see here, but this is a needle that's being inserted into that, that specimen. And we collect our data, we co-register it, we, we mark it, and then we send it off to the standard of care, which is pathology. Uh, and what we're interested in is identifying positive or close margins. And so if this red represents the tumor uh, that's really at the core of this mass, then there's going to be this outer cut surface that the surgeon, uh, this, it's the surgical margin. And, uh, and typically, we want that to be negative. And in fact, we want it to be greater than two millimeters away from any signs of tumor. Um, there could be what's called a close margin which is if, that, if we, the surgeon were to cut along that blue line, then it's within a millimeter of some of that, those tumor cells. That's a, considered a close margin. And a positive margin is if the surgeon were to cut along the red line, you can see that there is positive there are tumor cells both on that exposed margin, but if it's on the exposed margin, then likely there's also a tumor uh, left in the patient at that site as well. So these are the current definitions uh, that are established, but they're always changing. In fact, there was a, a study at the last uh, San Antonio Breast Conference that did not just structural analysis, but looked at the molecular changes that were going on in the tissue and, and did so at different distances away from that central tumor. And they found up to 5 to 10 millimeters away from that central part or any evidence of, of tumor they were finding molecular changes, suggesting that there is a very altered molecular tumor environment. And so perhaps we should not be looking just at structural changes, but we should be assessing the molecular changes that are, that are happening in the microenvironment. And that's what um, actually one of the goals of this last CARS spectroscopy techniques are, are trying to, to, to get at, and we'll talk about that. So once this is sent to pathology, then of course we do our comparisons and we try to do, analyze how well our interoperative imaging was relative to pathology. So uh, once we had that protocol set up, we did some studies with needle biopsies. There's typically t uh, several types of surgical procedures that use these, these needle biopsies. Uh, a fine needle is a very small, uh, small diameter needle that essentially aspirates or takes out just cells. A core needle is a larger diameter, and just as the name implies, it takes out a core of tissue, so it preserves the structure 
um, and which you don't get if you just aspirate cells. And then finally, water localization is a technique that's used where if they find a mass on, on a mammogram, they'll insert a wire through it, then they'll leave the wire in place um, as the, the, the patient then goes to, to surgery. And then the surgeon uses that wire as a guide to try to track down and find where that small lesion may be. And so our question is, can we provide real-time feedback or guidance during these procedures? Now, there's a lot of problems with the current way that, that we do these, these techniques. Uh, there's a very high non-diagnostic sampling rate. So as these small lesions in the breast uh, get identified at earlier stages, then it obviously becomes more and more difficult to sample those. And typically how sampling is done is that there is a stereotactic frame or ultrasound is used to identify a mass and try to put a needle into that mass. Uh, the resolution is poor and it's largely because imaging is done from the outside. And so part of our motivation is to, can we image within the needle itself as we're trying to guide these? Um, so this is a real problem. Uh, also, there's really no real time uh, method to guide these, the placement of these needles and it comes down to a sampling issue that you just have limited samples. If, if these uh, core needle biopsy systems go in and, and sample here, they'll usually take maybe four to six different cores uh, at different locations. And that's still, you would think, of considerable undersampling of that, that region. Okay, and it's really because of cost and time and, and uh, other issues for that. So our solution to this was really to build optics into the needle probe. And some of the earlier designs just had a very simple needle that uh, included an optical fiber, a focusing lens. We can either image with just uh, A scans out the tip in the forward direction, or maybe we would angle that and we would image off to the side and we can rotate that needle. We could pull it back to get a more of a volumetric imaging. And we saw structures like this, where if we were in adipose tissue, we would see these are A scans. So this is intensity versus depth. And, um, and we see adipose has a lot of these peaks. Tumor looks like this. Normal stroma looks like this. And just to kind of emphasize here a bit more clearly, these discrete peaks actually represent the different cell membranes of the adipose uh, tissue or cells. Uh, there is wide spacing. Uh, that's in contrast to the tumor. So you see that there's really no discrete peaks. There's a very sharp attenuation with depth. Uh, and that's contrasted again with more stroma, which is normal connective tissue in the breast, where we do see a lot of these random discrete peaks, uh, less attenuation than we do in the tumor. So if we can see these visual differences, this sets us up for automated algorithms that can classify these different signals. So that's what we did. With each of these, we can do different types of signal processing. We can look at sort of the mean distance between those peaks. We can do a, a 4A transform, and we can look at the, the spatial frequencies between those peaks. And just as a, an audio spectrum analyzer separates uh, music into different frequency channels, we can do that same thing. And we can look at each of these tissues will have different unique spectral signatures. And, uh, and again, use that information for an automated classification algorithm. We can do this then also on the images because that was all based on A scans. Images are just a series of A scans. And so each column in here was run through this classification algorithm. And these are the re results down here. The, the black is tumor, uh, the gray is stroma, and the white is adipose. And depending on different ways of combining that type of uh, 4A analysis, you can see they, they have different um, levels of, of accuracy. But in general, we're starting to see, I, automatically identify areas that are tumor versus that more of adipose. And we can see those differences more distinctly. It's a little bit harder. This is for a, a vertical boundary. If we have a horizontal boundary, uh, it's a little bit more difficult um, just because we have to look over depth at these changes. Uh, but we still can, can do this depending on the orientation of that, that physical margin. And if we look at all this, this data, this was over, I think, four to 6,000 uh, A scans. And we can use these different periodicity techniques, the 4A do domain, 
frequency spectrum or combining them, we get very good sensitivity and fairly good specificity. Now, if we just combine this simply with five adjacent axial scans, because we know that the tissue type is not going to change dramatically, you can see our numbers get even better. And that, those numbers compare very favorably uh, to the current methods of detecting, diagnosing ductal carcinoma um, in the breast. So you can see these for x-ray mammography or ultrasound. So we were very uh, positive about this. All this was done in ex vivo samples, you know, brought back to the lab and classified. But well, we wanted to take this as a next step and now go into the operating room uh, with this particular needle. We had a, a 10 different patients. For each specimen we got out, we were essentially mimicking what would be done uh, in the outpatient clinic. So normally a patient would come in, you know, would have this needle inserted, biopsies were taken. Well, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have a commercial sterile uh, needle that could be inserted into human breasts. Uh, so we st decided to first start by doing this in the OR on the breast specimens. And you can see the variety of different uh, uh, pathologies that were present. And so as that specimen came out, uh, there would be a zone of uh, supposedly normal tissue, the tumor would be down here, and we would have a calibrated um, markers on our needle as we would insert that, just as we were inserting through the skin into the, into the breast. And we recorded the depths and locations of these, and then did histology uh, to find out where that needle tip uh, ideally was located and determine what tissue type was really there. And so in this case, uh, this is the, the adipose tissue is located here. More of the fibrous tissue was kind of located there. Now, we did this for, for these nine different specimens. Each asterisk represents where we thought our needle was in the OR. But maybe you see the problem already is that there's going to be huge differences between where we thought we were in the OR and by the time they handled the specimen and processed it and, and, and sectioned it. And so um, in the end, you'll see by the numbers, we weren't really confident that uh, these matched very well. So nine patients, 40 regions of adipose, 18 regions of tumor tissue. If we combine the scattering profile and the refractive index, you can see uh, 89 sensitivity, 78 specificity. Um, we can play some statistical tricks to, to improve that. Uh, we looked at, can we just measure refractive index alone? And uh, we don't do quite as good as with the axial scan data. Just the scattering profile alone doesn't give us that good of information. So in general, by combining these, we get pretty good numbers. But they weren't as good as in our lab-based. And it's really because of this discrepancy between uh, where our, our needle measurement was really taking place and what tissue was really there. So what do we do next? Well, we, we had to build a better system. And we had to actually build a system that we could biopsy an image at the, at the exact same location, rather than rely on histology, uh, pathology lab to do this. So this was a, a 3D OCT guided core needle biopsy system. And we, we built this out of essentially commercial systems. There are vacuum-assisted core needle but breast biopsy systems commercially available that will essentially have a, a large bore needle that inserts into tissue. A vacuum is applied to draw the tissue into the needle, and then they shear it off and they sample this core. Well, these are fairly large bore needles, and we thought we could take a, an OCT catheter-based system, insert it into the needle, and use that for our, our collected um, uh, guidance information. And this was published in uh, Biomedical Express back in 2012. Uh, this is what it looks like up close. So this vacuum-assisted uh, core needle biopsy system has a, a long, hollow uh, needle. There's a biopsy channel at the tip. And, uh, and that vacuum will actually suck the tissue back into a tissue trap. So we modified this a couple of ways. First of all, we had to put an optical window uh, up front here where we could image with our catheter. Uh, we fed, and we had to modify back here where we could still have the, vac the vacuum, but we could then also insert our, our catheter all the way into our needle up to the tip. Okay, and this is just a, a zoom in of that front window. We had two uh, requirements. First of all, we had to have a transparent front window 
So as this needle was closed and being inserted into tissue, our catheter was located up at this tip and was imaging and we looking at the surrounding tissue. Once we got close to the, the lesion, then the, the channel, the biopsy channel, would actually open up. So that opens up on the needle. Our catheter would be uh, retracted back into this region here, where you could now image the tissue you were about to biopsy. Okay? Then you would activate the, the, the needle system. There would be a cutting sheath that would close over this channel. And then there would be a tissue that's trapped within that channel. You could now image what you just biopsied, and then you can vacuum suck the tissue back out to the trap. So you could image along all these different uh, stages to make sure that you're, you're getting the tissue of interest. And these are just some snapshots of uh, what we were looking at. Uh, you could see that there's, you know, half the image is taken up by the, uh, the needle barrel. And then this is where the tissue is uh, around that, that optical window. And then as we are inserting this into uh, a specimen, this was a, um, actually somewhat of a, a pseudo specimen. We took, uh, we took lymph node tissue and, and breast t lymph node tissue from a cat and chicken breast tissue and kind of put them together. Uh, so it's nothing you would find in, 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 in nature. But, um, but it gave us this uh, indication where we can find normal and, and uh, tumor tissue as we, we advance this. And then as we close that barrel, we could then see and look at the tissue that was trapped inside the, the, the barrel and differentiate. Uh, normal is much more heterogeneous than the, the dense tumor tissue. Um, with this, we get all kinds of three-dimensional data sets. And, uh, and I think our choice of tissue here was a little bit problematic because on histology, uh, the, the differences in the, the different tissue types were very subtle. And so we don't see a lot of differences on the OCT data, maybe a little bit here, which looks normal compared to the more dense tumor tissue. But it gives you an idea of the type of imaging that uh, we can do with this, this apparatus. And where we're going now with this technology is to, to do this in larger uh, animal models like dogs that have uh, mammary tumors and, and, and are seen here at our, our vet med school. So that's ongoing work for us. Okay, well that was some of our needle biopsy work. The next stage of the treatment is if these patients go to, go to surgery and have either a lumpectomy, which conserves most of the, the normal tissue of the breast, uh, mastectomy, there's also the lymph node biopsies uh, to be able to see if there's been uh, metastatic spread of the tumor. And again, we ask the question, can high resolution real-time imaging be used to uh, provide this diagnostic information? I mentioned the problem with the surgical margins. This is just an uh, example of five centimeter mass. Really, it's the center one or two centimeters where it's the, the primary tumor. But the surgeon has to take a larger margin around that to try to capture all the, the, the tumor cells that may be spreading out from that central mass. In the case of lymph nodes, lymph nodes are taken out to see if tumor has spread. But, uh, about 75% of the uh, lymph nodes taken out are negative, and only 25% are metastatic. There's also a false negative rate. The problem with taking out lymph nodes is that you're disrupting the, the vascular, the lymphatic drainage of the tissue. And so there's a, a significant problem with lymphedema. When you take out that, that fluid drainage system, fluid builds up. And so these, these patients have really painful, morbid, um, you know, this isn't going to kill you, but it just makes your life miserable the rest of your life. And patients are susceptible to viral infections. Uh, they have a, lots of other complications. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So this is an ongoing issue as well because some people debate whether it's important to take these out at all. Um, some people will say, well, if I'm taking out 20, you know, 25% of those lymph nodes have tumor in them. If I'm taking out tumor, that's a good thing, right? But others say, well, if there's tumor in the lymph node, there's already tumor everywhere else in the body. And so it doesn't help to take it out. You're not, you know, the bigger problem is you've got tumor probably everywhere else. And you've got to, you still have to go to radiation or chemotherapy. So that's really still an ongoing debate. That's what has driven 
at least uh, sentinel node biopsies. So they used to take out all the lymph nodes, like in the case of breast cancer, it's the lymph nodes in your armpit. And they used to take out all those lymph nodes, all that tissue, and then analyze them. Uh, but the sentinel biopsy is where they'll inject contrast into the tumor area. And they will see which lymph node does most of that signal or contrast show up in. And then they only have to take out maybe one lymph node. Uh, and that's reduced a lot of the complications, but you know, even that is kind of debatable. So um, surprisingly, in, in breast cancer therapy, both for margins and lymph nodes, there's still a lot of debate, and, uh, and we don't know what the best answer is. Again, it's sampling rates that are, that are an issue. So in the lymphatic system, just to give you, uh, have, have, are people familiar with lymph nodes and kind of their, a little bit of this anatomy? and <clears throat> the, uh, the way to think about these are they're just filters. So they're filters of our body to capture <clears throat> you know, bacteria, viruses, foreign bodies, and elicit immune response. And they drain. We have lymph nodes everywhere. But uh, their location is to drain lymphatic fluid from different parts of the body. And the structures within the lymph nodes are very intricate. These are complicated uh, organ systems. Uh, generally, um, this is the schematic, but generally the, the lymph, this is a separate you know, fluid system separate from the blood, uh, will, will be arriving at these lymph nodes from these afferent lymphatics. And then that lymph will percolate through these lymph nodes uh, and then come out and drain through this efferent lymphatic. Along the way, there's all kinds of immune cells that are interacting with that and can have these changes. Well, a lot of the changes that occur when there's foreign particles or metastatic cells uh, occur in the outer capsule or the region around these lymph nodes. So it's within the depth range of OCT. And we see changes in this capsule um, these follicles here, which will change if there's an immune response, or the cortex, uh, which is, again, this, this outer region. And so in a normal lymph node, you have these follicles you know, that are identified from these immune cells. If, you've, if you, any of you get perhaps just a, a cold or an infection, you may feel lymph nodes in your neck get swollen. Those become reactive, and we just get more of these follicles produced. That's just a normal response. Uh, immune response. But if there's tumor cells that are present, then you will get a reactive type response, but there's tumor cells that will then set up shop, start dividing, become metastatic, and we see distinct changes uh, within those lymph nodes uh, that are detectable. The, uh, the move to the sentinel node biopsy has been really advantageous. So the sentinel node is, a, if you have a, a drainage pattern, it's believed to be that first node where that drainage uh, uh, goes. And, uh, and so therefore, by putting in things such as a radioactive agent or blue dyes, people are starting to put in near-infrared dyes and use optics to identify where these go. And so you, you put those uh, agents into the primary tumor site. Lymphatics will drain to that lymph node. Um, all of these techniques, however, only help the surgeon find the node. They don't say anything about what, what, what that node may contain. Is it a normal node? Is it metastatic? And, uh, and so that's where we think you know, OCT is going to be uh, beneficial. These are some examples of 3D OCT. This happens to be of, on rat lymph nodes where we could control um, the, the stage at which uh, the, the metastatic spread has been going into these nodes. Uh, and so we, we essentially created a tumor uh, in, the, in the rat, um, and then looked at the lymph nodes in the drainage pattern, and at different time points, removed those nodes. And we saw um, we can get 3D volumes here. We can look at these in different orientations. You can see the f follicular structure. Uh, this is a normal, uh, normal node. But um, we can start to see some of these, these, these structural features. In human lymph nodes, we see, again, similar features as well. These are 3D cutaways. And you can see the, the sinus, uh, the capsule. You can start to see some of that scattering structure on the inside. And if we look at a normal lymph node, if you remember that very first 3D image I showed, the, norm, the normal lymph node has relatively low scattering. And this is just confirmed with histology. Uh, but that is very different from a metastatic node, 
which is very dense and has a very high scattering uh, properties on OCT. And then in the case of the, the reactive node, it's somewhere in between areas that are high scattering, but then there's low scattering areas. And these are just those enlarged follicles that are present from a reactive node. So we have ongoing studies now uh, that are looking at, we've probably imaged over 100 patients and nodes to be able to identify uh, and look up these features of what constitutes a, a normal reactive or metastatic node. And the idea is that to be able to do this without taking those nodes out, to be able to insert a uh, probe and look in vivo whether or not those nodes are, are, are metastatic or not. And so those final results are still coming. Okay, <clears throat> so moving on to tumor margins, then we want to use the same type of idea with OCT. Uh, our first uh, early study looked at what things might complicate uh, our, our imaging. Well, a normal surgical margin uh, has a lot of adipose tissue. And that's all shown here is these white areas, dark areas are, are, are nuclei, individual point-like areas are nuclei. If there's surface blood, that shows up as a highly scattering, thin type film. Um, oftentimes surgeons will use cautery, uh, like a, a very hot probe to, to, to heat up tissue and, and stop bleeding. Uh, those cautery artifacts are, are very shallow and highly scattering. But when we start seeing things like this, um, duck-like structure that are filled with dense, uh, dense deposits or something that's very shadowing like this, uh, these are more indicative of cancer. And we're seeing these at the margins. So again, here's a, a normal margin with histology. Uh, here's examples of that heterogeneous scattering structure. This is DCIS, ductal car carcinoma in situ. Uh, and this is invasive ductal carcinoma, which is kind of extending beyond our penetration depth here. And this is an example of just an isolated DCIS in a duct here. Um, and that's the, the corresponding histology, all about a size of about a millimeter, something smaller than what could be visualized uh, with the naked eye or even palpated you know, by the surgeon in the, uh, in the operating room. And just another case of, of papillary carcinoma. But again, just very heterogeneous scattering structures uh, along these margins. And of course, doing this in 3D, and, uh, and our, our first study that came out in 09 uh, looked at just about uh, a subset, 38 patients that had a training set and a study set. We looked at all different types of cancers. So this was really about making a decision in the OR. Is there uh, a cancer present? Is there something abnormal or is this normal? And uh, that's somewhat of an easier binary decision than it is to make a diagnosis. And that's an important point because a lot of these modalities uh, for OCT, for screening like this, um, are, are probably never going to be as good as that histology that we can get that's used as the gold standard to make a diagnosis. But we can tell you very quickly whether or not something's normal or abnormal. And uh, so we got very good sensitivity and specificity uh, using OCT in this way. Well, this, that success really launched uh, a startup company, Diagnostic Photonics, and this was founded back in 2008. Um, currently, we have uh, nine, nine employees. We've, we've finished uh, several rounds of funding. We've completed trials out at Johns Hopkins and some of their other uh, clinical centers out there. And, uh, and now, um, with our next round of funding, is probably going to go to multi-institutional trials at MD Anderson, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, San Francisco, just all across the U.S. and in Europe as well. And, uh, and we've gotten um, other issues that are related to this. We've gotten uh, regulatory issues, so 510K, a uh, step toward FDA approval for using this in the OR, and also reimbursement. So every time procedures are done, uh, doctors want to get paid for them, and so they have to have a code that they s submit to get reimbursed for that procedure. And we just uh, last, uh, I think it was this spring, uh, received new codes, CPT codes, that are approved for this type of intraoperative imaging. So as all this becomes available, the doctors that use this will then get reimbursed and they're more likely to use it. Anyways, uh, one of the, the core <coughs> uh, elements to this company, though, was to use not just OCT, but a computational technique called ISAM. And did Professor Carney talk about ISAM? So 
that's good. He provided that intro, uh, that theory. But he's, he was a co-founder with me uh, on this company to really allow us to use these computational approaches to improve our imaging here as well. And I'll show more about that in a second. This is, um, <clears throat> with this, this technology, these handheld probes uh, like this, we've started uh, a clinical trial here at Carl where we can use this to do in vivo imaging. So we're moving now not only from that specimen that's taken out, but now the surgeon is is using this probe in the tumor cavity because ultimately it's probably more important to figure out what you left behind rather than what you just took out. And, uh, and so this is an example of a representative case. This was a 72-year-old white female that had a partial uh, mastectomy. Um, and, and so biopsy proven, uh, had the mass resected. Now as the surgeon then was looking around the tumor cavity, he said, there, here's an area that looks suspicious along that margin, okay? And that's important that he had to identify that first because this technology is not approved. He can't use this initially to guide yet. Uh, but he found a suspicious area. It was imaged with our uh, handheld probe, and, uh, and that looked very suspicious. In fact, uh, very positive for a uh, positive margin. The surgeon took a re-excision of that margin, which he was going to do anyways. We then re-imaged the new uh, cavity margin, and it looked negative. Uh, then, of course, we imaged ex vivo as we normally did and sent that all off to histology for comparison. So these are the video sequences that were captured. The top was that positive, what we thought was positive in situ cavity margin. And we see adipose tissue. Uh, and then we start seeing these dense, heterogeneous areas here, all along here. You can see it's kind of very heterogeneous, very solid. And uh, that's what we thought looked very positive. Then after that margin was resected, we imaged again. This is the negative margin. We see stroma, this long streaks, uh, our normal connective tissue. So that's very different from the, the dense uh, tumor areas, but a lot of adipose tissue as well. And that's what we saw after that resection. Now, this is just still images of that in situ positive margin. And then that same site was imaged ex vivo with the probe. So again, very dense, heterogeneous. Uh, and then this is that in situ negative margin, just to compare the two differences. Now we had histology on that positive margin. And that confirmed that indeed it was a positive margin, all very dense tumor tissue right at that positive margin, uh, confirming a lot of the features that we saw uh, intraoperatively. So this is some of the first, uh, first ever in vivo, real time OCT imaging of these, these tumor margins. And this, of course, is we're in the, in the process of finalizing and, and, and writing that, those studies up. Well, Professor Carney talked about ISAM, so I won't go into a lot of the theory there, but ISAM essentially allows us to improve our resolution over larger depths of, of field. And this is a comparison between OCT and ISAM, whereas realizing with, with uh, optical imaging, when we focus down, uh, our highest transverse resolution is at the focus, which we assume. But we have a, a sort of an hourglass type beam profile, and above and below the focus, uh, that transverse resolution worsens. And However, with OCT, because we collect this type of phase information, you can think of, we can create a synthetic aperture. So as this, this hourglass Gaussian beam is focused, um, that wave front can be decomposed into multiple plane waves. Okay? And those plane waves, if we have a point scatterer that we scan our beam across, then that point scatterer is going to be imaged at multiple angles from multiple plane waves. And you can use that information to reconstruct what the true object uh, representation or size is uh, and essentially obviate this, this apparent trade-off that you know, outside the focus, things are blurry. Well, they're not blurry. They're just not reconstructed. And so this is an example of these point scatterers with OCT um, that this is around the focal plane here, but the further we go away, 
we see that we see in fact interference patterns from multiple point scatterers. But with ISAM, we can reconstruct each of these is really a point scatter of titanium dioxide. Uh, and we can use this to improve our resolution. Now just recently, uh, last fall, we took this uh, and, and demonstrated we can do this in vivo. Uh, we can get phase stable information. We need phase stability to be able to reconstruct those wave fronts and this data. And uh, this was done in, in human skin at, with GPUs, very fast. Uh, but the fact that we can uh, normally get OCT images like this, we, can, we showed that as we scan a 3D volume, there's a fast axis and a slow axis. And we can separately process these, these axes independently and reconstruct this information. So we get 3D ISAM. And we, in this case, this is uh, uh, the, the sort of the forest of little sweat ducts in your skin. And we get much better, more accurate representation of the size of those sweat ducts and, uh, and really improvements in resolution away from the focus using, uh, using ISAM. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so phase stability. It's phase stability, there's a couple tricks to improve on that. Uh, one is just speed. So if you scan faster, things have less time to move. Uh, phase instabilities come from movement in the, in the sample, they, uh, like Brownian motion or cellular uh, activity. Uh, it can be from physical movement of just moving, say, your hand or the tissue. Is this one, one way of knowing that phase stability? Not the same. Not the same. But it's more just, uh, there's many factors. So just jitter from your imaging instrument. It could be uh, phase instabilities of your source. Uh, it could be, you know, again, many different types of coupling between the, the, the instrument and, and the tissue. And so speed helps to, to reduce a lot of those. Uh, there's also tricks that you can play um, in having a, a phase reference. So if you have, if, if your phase instability comes from your, your, your laser and your system and your scanning, well, if you take and place a small cover slip over the tissue that you're imaging and use that as a phase reference, then what you're really interested in is the phase difference between the cover slip and the tissue instead of the tissue and, say, the laser or the system. So there's lots of tricks that you can play. And, and to get these images, the, you know, the skin was kind of pressed, just pressed up against a, a glass window. Uh, and <clears throat> we're looking at, in my group, a lot of other different techniques that you can actually con reconstruct um, and correct the phase based on the data itself. Um, and so. That's what's key to not only ISAM, but Doppler and spectroscopic and polarization sensitive OCT. All these, these techniques rely on sort of phase uh, based information. And if we can improve how we collect that information, we can improve all those techniques. Um, <clears throat> so those are basically some of the, uh, the techniques we used. The axes here, this is uh, the vertical axis is the full width, half max, really of kind of the, the point spread function. And this is the distance from the focus. So what's getting worse here is OCT, and, uh, and this is 2D ISAM. Um, <clears throat> along the slow axis, our 2D ISAM was getting just as worse as OCT because we weren't scanning fast enough. Uh, so that's just an example of how you know, these, these, these stabilities affect. And that's what you're seeing here, is basically that uh, we have points here. And in the two, along this slow axis, we see this, this blurring of these, these objects. That's what those plots represent. So in, in more highly scattering tissue, the, the enhancements are a little bit more subtle. Uh, this is in vivo human skin. And, uh, and you can see that there's a, a bit sharpening of some of these structural features. This image here is the ISAM corrected. <clears throat> it's a little bit sharper than the OCT image. Uh, up here, this is really comparing where we place the focus. And depending on where we place the focus, uh, we can see very intricate structures in muscle, so the muscle fibers. And uh, so this isn't comparing with OCT. This is just ISAM. But uh, we can see structures like these muscle fibers, which are difficult uh, to see with OCT. <clears throat> so even in multiply scattering, highly scattering tissue, this works. It's just the, it's, it's not as obvious because we have this huge multiply scattered 
light background. And that's another area of uh, our constant work is trying to separate those, those differences um, out. Okay, well another thing we can do with the phase information or this wavefront information is if we know, if, if we computationally use it to correct our point objects or improve our resolution, uh, we can also use the distortions of those wavefronts to tell us something about the aberrations that are present either in our optical system or in our sample itself. And correcting aberrations are also just as important as correcting resolution uh, in your sample. <coughs> so we make use of that information. And I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of the theory and background behind this. But just think of it in terms of correcting those wavefronts to remove those aberrations or identify them. And, uh, and so with OCT, if we collect, uh, in this case, this is a sample of point scatterers that were imaged with a highly astigmatic beam. And so with an astigmatic beam, meaning that it's going to be uh, in focus at two different points in depth. Okay, So at one point, there's the sagittal focus. And you can see these point scatters are really sharp in one dimension, but not in the other. At this meridional focus, it's the opposite. Okay, And this is the uh, property of astigmatic, uh, or astigmatic beams. <laughs> And so in between here is what's called the circle of least confusion, where it's somewhat of a midpoint of those, those two aberration, or those two foci. But that plane is not really in focus. Okay? And so if we use aberration corrected OCT, uh, we can actually make each of these planes look more <coughs> circularly symmetric. Okay? So we eliminated this sort of linear uh, aberration, but everything is still blurry. So then we use our ISAM to correct all these planes. So now we've also eliminated the aberrations that may be present in the beam, uh, as well as correcting for that, uh, that resolution. And this is just in uh, uh, a 3D data set of rat lung tissue. Again, OCT, uh, uncorrected ISAM, and then aberration corrected ISAM, and we're improving uh, these types of point scatterers. We can do this virtually because we have computational data that we can tweak. And aberrations are often expressed or by different Zernike polynomials. And we can computationally correct these. And if we look at um, right here is going to be sort of the phase or the, the mask applied at the pupil plane. This is the amplitude and phase at the focus. And then amplitude and phase at each one of these uh, foci with the astigmatic beam. And if we cycle through these, you can see that we can correct different Zernike polynomials and computationally adjust. Now this is in focus. Now we bring this one in focus. And, uh, and then we come back to correcting uh, the focus you know, at, the, uh, at the center, at that circle of least confusion. So we have now can computationally apply these and, uh, and play with it, uh, correcting our, our aberrations. OK. So the last, uh, the last topic I want to talk about is the use of, of these molecular imaging techniques. And we heard really a great talk from uh, you know, Professor Bargav about making pathology, histopathology quantitative. And, uh, and in a somewhat similar way, we're doing uh, the same thing, but using cars and interferometric cars because this is something that we think we could also then take in vivo and take into the operating room, just like we've done with OCT. So for us, we're interested in breast tissue. And we recognize that there are distinct spectral signatures that differentiate lipids from proteins. And there is also a very well-known transition between protein, proteins or from lipids in normal breast tissue to proteins in tumor tissue in the breast. And so that's what we focused on for this type of transition. And in fact, what's shown here is uh, a CARS or NIVI interferometric CARS image of normal mammary tissue and from a rat. And you can see that each pixel is really a, as, as Dr. Bargov said, represents a spectrum. Uh, but we've color coded that to be areas of, of either lipids or proteins. And so you can generally see that 
this is really lipid rich, all the red areas here, and they, you see the outlines of these adipocytes. Well, these other three are different stages of tumor, rat mammary tumor, and you can see that that normal adipose structure is broken up. You can see that there's a lot more protein rich regions now uh, in these areas. So again, label free endogenous molecular changes. And, uh, and I showed you this uh, last time about the schematic, but this is really using a lot of the same OCT type principles. Uh, it's a spectral domain, but now we're after the coherent car signal. And we generate a spectrogram just like you would in OCT, uh, but only now this is the coherent car signal. And we can identify those two different spectra, whether or not they look more tumor-like or, or uh, normal, and, uh, and then color code and classify that. So whereas before I was showing skin, here is now this mammary tumor. And if we have uh, adipose tissue, blue is good. So we see all that, the fat in the adipocytes. This is the histology. Red is bad. So the tumor uh, is really protein rich and shown here. And then there's normal stroma uh, that is very, still very dense tissue but largely classified as normal. There are some areas that are pink and suspicious, uh, but you know, still would be classified as normal. So we have this way of classifying, and we did a fairly large study with uh, different rats and tumor tissue where we automatically classified these types of, uh, of, of images, and we saw very good distinguishing uh, differentiation between the normal tissue in blue and the tumor tissue shown in red. And, uh, and so we even purposefully found samples that were close to this normal tumor line. And the reason they were close was not because the algorithm was ambiguous, but because they were actually a, a margin. So half of that field of view contained a tumor and half of it was normal. And this raises the question, can we use this type of automated molecular tumor margin identification? And so coming back to that point I had mentioned earlier, the, the tumor margin may not be the structural margin that the pathologist sees, but it may be the molecular margin where this, this microenvironment has changed and is now much more amenable or you know, suitable for, for metastatic uh, or tumor invasion. And that's, this is ongoing work that uh, we're developing to uh, really develop new optical sources that we can use these techniques and, and, and move this into the operating room and essentially follow where we've already been with OCT. So as an example of just some of this translational work, uh, th this is kind of the, the more complete picture where this is a technology, again, developing out of the lab that has, uh, is, has been very amenable for translation into clinical applications, uh, commercial applications, uh, both for looking at margins looking at lymph nodes, um, using needles, using handheld probes, and uh, co combined with some of the computational techniques. And then in the future, we think these molecular techniques will, will soon follow. So um, again, to thank the people in my group, the people in red are those that uh, are working specifically on this interoperative work. And uh, again, just a great a team of collaborators as well, uh, medical oncologists that will uh, recruit patients, our surgeons that we work with, our pathologists, uh, that really all have to come together for these, these types of studies. So thanks again for your attention and happy to answer questions. So, yeah. Any more questions? I know everyone's hungry. I am as well. Yeah. So I sort of asked Mr. Carney this question. I sort of want to see the same thing. Yeah, so you know, people have used, there's, there's many other techniques for extended depth of field imaging. You can use different phase masks, um, you know, hardware like uh, optical elements that will affect the phase. Uh, Bessel beams um, essentially can be created with like axicon lenses. Um, you can use um, uh, Renner, like Geb from uh, I think Austria, has used different computational techniques to have you know, multiple foci. You can shift the focus, uh, and so there are other ways to do this. Um, 
you know, it's interesting. Me personally, I don't know what Professor Carney answered, but uh, um, you know, people have been using these Bessel beams. Uh, generally, with that though, a lot of the power ends up going into these side lobes, and and so you do get this extended depth, but you throw away a lot of your power that way. That isn't contributing to your signal. Uh, one of the things we always get with ISAM, a question we always get is, do we get, you know, enhanced imaging penetration uh, with this? And and the answer is no. We're we're not really going beyond anything that, uh, in terms of the SNR, um, that we get from, uh, based on OCT. But uh, so we're not increasing our depth. We're just essentially kind of making better use of the information uh, that's being collected. So I, I guess I, I think in, in terms of, and of course I'm biased, but I think ISAM is probably superior to some of these other uh, beam shaping techniques. Uh, they have some really interesting roles though because I've been impressed. Uh, have people heard of light sheet microscopy where you create a, a, a nice uniform plane or sheet of light and that illuminates the sample. So it essentially eliminates having to scan in one dimension. You can then come in with your confocal or fast scanning orthogonal to that sheet and everything's illuminated. Um, they've been using Bessel beams in, and I think um, uh, Betzig at uh, Janilo Pharmas has been using this and that's a really in interesting way uh, of using those. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah and um, uh, Krishna, no, I'm blanking, Dakara at St. Andrews in the UK I think has also been doing this uh, using different, um, you know, not best, oh, best beams, airy beams, uh, shaping the wave front for this too. So I don't know if that, that's my perspective. I don't know if that was an answer. But. Sort of looking into one of the problems with the airy beams is that they don't change with uh, wavelengths. So when you sweep, you have to be more computation. How do we steer it? Uh, so the, the first question is, how do we translate? Mm -hmm. so, um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of, uh, for the catheter, there's a couple of ways that we can translate. Uh, so physically, if we take this catheter and insert it in the back end of the needle, um, that's moving the whole plastic sheath of the catheter um, into the needle. And, uh, and so within that plastic sheath, the, the optics can, can be translated. And that's done by having a, a translation stage back in the instrument at the, at the proximal end of the, the catheter. So there is a, a, a control unit that both uh, will pull the optics within the plastic sheath and also rotate them. And there is a, uh, a, a, like a fiber optic rotary junction uh, that allows the catheter to be connected but then rotate. And so, so that catheter um, can rotate, it can be translated, pulled back as well. The, uh, in terms of steering, for once that's in the needle, all the steering is really done just by the operator trying to, to position the needle. And, and so that's, uh, it can be somewhat crude uh, to be able to uh, position those because you're, you're going through tissue, sometimes you have to pull back and kind of re-angle and, and, and insert again. Um, so you have some flexibility of trying to position that needle, but not a lot. And so I, I think that ultimately these, these systems still have to be used with, say, ultrasound to guide the needle you know, to that small, the area of the lesion. But, but I think then you, you would switch to an OCT mode to be able to look and find position, you know, are you at the lesion? Does it look, you know, abnormal? Did you biopsy it? One of the, uh, the, the major questions is that a surgeon or a person doing the procedure will take multiple cores, but again, they don't know if they got the lesion until pathology processes the tissue. And so you can imagine taking six or eight cores, you know, and, and then finding out that you missed you miss the lesion. Everything that pathology finds is normal tissue. And then 
often t what happens in that case is is the patient would just go to open surgery. You, you can't you can't risk doing another needle biopsy procedure, and you can't risk just ignoring it. You have to go to open surgery. So there is about uh, I think it's maybe like a twenty percent, maybe fifteen to twenty percent of the time uh, they have to go to open surgery to remove that mass, and then it may be of course benign. So. Other questions? Yeah. Um, generally, I was just wondering what, like, the surgeons thought when they were using your handheld OCT yeah. device. Like, did they like using it in the surgery? Did they think it was helpful? Was it, yeah. how were they looking at the images? Uh huh. Yeah, good questions. So I think our surgeons are a bit quirky. Um, they don't think like engineers, which is probably good. Um, but anyways, they weren't interested in the images. They didn't, well, at first, they didn't want to look at the images because they didn't want to be bi biased by the images. So w this system is not FDA approved. So we have to very clearly, and we've explained to them, <coughs> drive it into their heads. We can't use this information to influence your standard of care yet. Um, and so because of that, uh, you know, I think they just got in the habit of, of scanning with the probe, asking us, you know, you know, how's it look? Am I doing OK here? Uh, their objective really is just to, to make sure that they scan the probe over all the area as we're collecting all this real-time data. And then we go back and they tell us, okay, I'm on the anterior you know, quadrant, now I'm the lateral, lateral margin. You know, they tell us where they're at, and we write all that down and go back and look. <clears throat> In the case I showed, that's something that they identified with their own you know, standard of care, this looks suspicious. And indeed, our OCT was really suggesting it was. And histology showed it. <clears throat> so, I think, though, they're very excited to use it. I mean, they, they really appreciate the, 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 the microscopic view. Uh, they're, they're anxious to learn, you know, what the images look like and mean. Uh, surgeons have already used interoperative ultrasound. So they're used to looking at that type of image, except they have to realize this is, you know, one or two orders of magnitude, higher resolution, smaller scale. Um, but I think they're really, they're really enthusiastic to use it. and, and uh, and, and know it's and appreciates its value. Have you ever like gone back and, like after the survey and showed them the OCT images and gotten there? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in fact, a lot of our, our sensitivity specificity numbers came out of um, actually students were reading the images and interpreting them. With the company, uh, their trials that just finished, they actually had surgeons, pathologists, radiologists, and OCT grad students. Uh, you know, read these. And it turned out that the surgeons actually were the most uh, uh, predictive or accurate in interpreting those. Uh, and the reason we think that's true is because they have a context. You know, they, they, uh, they kind of know what areas they, they were scanning. So they kind of already had some information, like, Does this, is this suspicious in my mind? If it is, they kind of use that. They, they were biased some set. Whereas everybody else was kind of completely blinded. They had no context you know, where that image came from, it's just an image in front of them, and what's their call. So I think that was also very optimistic. I think once, uh, it's the, once you put the image data with all the rest of the information in the, in the surgical field, I think it would be a really powerful technique. Yeah, uh, so I think what you were saying, so we, we can do OCT right, a lot of the automatic classification based on the OCT data can all be done in real time. Uh, the CARS, um, that's what you were asking about the CARS? The needle biopsy. The needle biopsy. Um, yes, so that, some of the, the, I was showing one video clip. We, we do have video files, so all that information is collected in real time. And then we could couple the, those automatic classification you know, to that real-time needle biopsy as well. And that's a good point because we get, both with the needle and with the handheld probe, we get so much more image data than we, than we can analyze. So no one can look at it all in real time. And so that's where these algorithms are going to be really important to you know, turn on the red light and flash, you know, something looks abnormal, stop, you know, look closely here. Again, not for diagnosis, just to say something's abnormal and look more closely. 
I think that'll all be coming. Yeah. Yeah. When you think the uh, needle last, you guys look at the we didn't. Uh, so David Sampson at University of Western Australia, he's doing that. Um, but that was something that uh, you know really is a, a nice complementary technique because as you're inserting the needle, you're applying this mechanical force. You can look and see how you're compressing. Yeah, you know the distance. Um, and so in some sense, it, it's I don't know if the stress can really be accurately known because depending on the tissue. Uh, you know, you may be cutting through it at different rates. It's not going to necessarily respond to the same for, you know, force. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're, we're getting close to lunch, so let's all uh, run down there. Thanks.